I have a book that I've I've started reading. Uh, it's called A Profession Without Reason, about uh, about so the psychology kind of uh, profession and 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 how ultimately there haven't been any like if you if you do like the I don't know how you measure happiness, but like the outcomes that they're looking for, despite 40, 50 years of development, they haven't increased the outcomes that they're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, and again, it, it, yeah. And it goes back to what I said earlier, which is that when you, when you constantly medicalize things, yeah, instead of socializing them in the sense that you start looking at problems beyond just the mere pharmacological or medicinal. Yeah. Like you're not you just get, depressed. You also live in a society that constantly bombards you with shit. <laughs> bingo, right? <laughs> All right. Hi, and welcome to Red Reviews uh, with myself and Justin Clark, the podcast where we cover a variety of leftist books. Thanks for joining me, going? Justin. How's it going, Corey? <laughs> Not too bad. Yourself? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm uh, excited to be back. It's been a little bit of a, of a break. I've been getting over being sick, ironically enough, because we're going to be talking about healthcare tonight. But, um, but yeah, no, I've just been getting over being sick, and so it was kind of a Really off and on kind of crummy month of August, but I'm back and ready to go. I'm very excited about getting back into things. Right on. Uh, we already have a comment. The Kerrigan uh, says, hi, guys, on uh, on YouTube. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for joining us. Oh, and uh, some random geek is over on Twitch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so thanks for joining us, you two. What up? <laughs> Well, thank you both for being here tonight. Really excited. I was so worried people might forget about me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. It's really, really good. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it was um, the last month or so has really put in the foreground of my mind why healthcare is really important and how a lack of it can be a real problem in our society. And um <laughs> gotta smash that like button <laughs> yeah that's right um and so you know a while back um we had planned to record this i think in early august or late july but um but tonight we're going to be talking about the book health communism okay um by uh it's by beatrice adler bolton and arnie Vierkent. Um, who are the hosts of the Death Panel podcast? I've never okay. listened to that show, but I, I did a little background either. reading, um, and uh, and so they uh, done a podcast that covers a wide variety of um, topics related to healthcare. Ooh. And this book is, in many ways, I guess, a kind of a crystallization of some of their bigger ideas. Um, I really like this book. Um, I think that. Uh, it's a very interesting and thought-provoking uh, sort of primer on how capitalism distorts our notions of health. That even the very concept of health itself is something that might even be developed within the context of the capitalist system. You know, I don't think when our ancestors were <laughs> hunter-gatherers or early medieval societies, people thought of themselves as healthy or not. Right. Especially and especially not terms like wellness or well-being, yeah. you know. Um, it reminds me very much of one of my other favorite writers who we've covered on the show. We'll probably cover again in the future, um, Christopher Lash, hmm. who wrote a lot about in his work about the sort of the medicalization of social issues and social stru problems with social structures. Right. Then instead of addressing the real social issues of society. And, and how these structures oppress us. It sort of pushes it back on individuals to figure it out for themselves. And the sort of increasing psycho psychologization and medicalization of society. And this book goes into that, um, and I think very profoundly, especially in its later chapters, which cover um, a radical political organization called SBK, the Socialist Patients Collective. Okay. Um, cool. The German name is Socialistisches Patenden Collective, which is a little bit harder to say. So I'll just say SBK or I'll say Socialist Patient Collective. And we'll get into that in a bit. Um, but uh, Beatrice Adler Bolton um, 
is an artist as well as an author. Oh, cool. Um, their art is very interesting, um, more in the modernist end to kind of underscore okay. the ways in which these systems oppress us without us really even maybe even being consciously aware of it. And health is one of those. And so, you know, health communism, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, first off, it's a great title and, and it's a, it's a great idea. Cause one of the things that's been really hot in terms of like political debates over the last few years has been, at least in the U S has been Medicare for all, um, yeah, most yeah. notably championed by Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont. Um, and most of the democratic candidates in 2019, um, before, uh, their corporate donors were like, no, you can't do that. And so some of them like supported Medicare for all, like Kamala Harris did for like a hot minute. So did Elizabeth Warren, like some of them did. And then they sort of had to walk it back. Pete Buttigieg did his version, which was Medicare for all who want it, which is some (laughs) like real slippery (laughs) And basically what it was, was it was a more, it was a more tortured phrase than, than Medicare for all is Medicare for all is a very simple, clear phrase. Everybody ever can stand Medicare for all for those who want it. Well, what the hell does that mean? What that meant was the public option, which is something that mainstream corporate sort of neoliberal Democrats have championed for years. And then even then, even that modest intervention was not tolerated, especially during the debates about the Affordable Care Act, you know, back in the the halcyon days of 2009, 2010, when when there was still a modicum of optimism left to us, uh, at least for me. (laughs) And, um, and so they couldn't even let, they couldn't even let the public option happen then. Right. You know, when, when the political will for it was probably at its biggest height and, um, and, you know, but our advocates for Medicare for all have made the argument that, well, if you do a public option, meaning that anybody can buy health insurance on the private marketplace, which is how we have it in the United States, or you buy into the public health option, that's an alternative. Anybody can buy into it and get it. Um, and, the problem with that is that the private options will always undermine the public ones. Yeah. Yeah. We're it's seeing always right- going to be higher yeah. paid to doctors or for certain types of medical care will, will be like higher quality. Yeah. Uh, there, the lineups for the public option will be too long. So people will be paying for the private one. And like, mm-hmm. yeah, we're seeing that in Canada, the attempt to undermine the universal care. So. Yeah, see, they're doing this, and they're kind of, this is a this is a global trend, especially with countries who have some forms of government health insurance, whether it's the United States with um, Medicare and Medicaid, or even full blown government run healthcare like the Veterans Administration, the VA. Right. Um, what they're doing with the VA now is, is is they're giving vouchers to veterans to basically use to purchase healthcare in the market rather than getting care through the VA. And it's okay. like, wouldn't it be a more efficient use of resources to fund the VA and just have them go to the VA? Yeah. But they don't want to do that. And and they're do, they're trying to do the same thing with Medicare. This is how like most politicians talk out both sides of their mouths. And it's no surprise that Biden did this on Medicare. Because as as candidate and as a president, he said, like, I'm not going to undermine health. I'm not going to undermine Medicare. Right. You know? We're not going to defund Medicare. We're not going to privatize Medicare. Right. But they're doing it anyway. Yeah. And the way that they're doing it is they're doing it through um, shifting certain types of care to be carried more by what they call Medicare Advantage plans. So in the United States, Medicare is the public health option for those over 65. But there are certain things that Medicare does not cover. So Medicare, and this is something Bernie talks about all the time. Medicare does not cover dental it does not cover right. vision and it does not cover hearing aids. Okay. So you and so and it doesn't cover certain forms of prescriptions, doesn't cover certain forms of surgeries, doesn't perform doesn't cover certain things. So in the United States, people have to buy a supplemental insurance plan to right. supplement what is not covered through Medicare. My grandmother who had a Medicare Advantage plan through Humana. And so like and what they're going to do and the way they're going to do privatization is death by a thousand cuts. So instead of doing like a big, huge overhaul, you know, overhaul or reimagining or reform or whatever <laughs> word they're going to come up right. with to sell it yeah. um, through some big sweeping change, they're just going to do it through policy um, that is set by the, by, you know, in, in the case of the United States, it'll be set by the Department of Health and Human Services. They'll just rewrite regulatory policy to find ways to shift 
the bur- healthcare burden onto individuals instead right. of having the government take it on. Um, and I would imagine it's similar to to Canada. On uh, YouTube, uh, some random geek says, so I'm alive, but I can't see or hear well because of the system. Great. <laughs> yeah, it's absurd, right? <laughs> yep. in, in the United States, we call, we make the joke that de- that teeth are like what we call them luxury bones. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's like they're not covered, you know, so you have to get a supplemental vision. You have to get supplemental dent- dental. And that's all because <laughs> yeah. of the way that healthcare developed as a policy starting really in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and uh, so it was always kind of this like, Rube Goldberg, Frankenstein's monster to mix metaphors um, <laughs> of, of care. It was always like that. Right. And yeah. so Medicare for all would be a big step towards that. Now is, is Medicare for all socialized medicine? Well, to a point. Right. So Medicare for all doesn't privatize the hospitals. It doesn't privatize the doctors or sorry. It doesn't, it does not make them publicly pub- owned. Make yeah. them public, publicly owned. It doesn't nationalize the hospitals. Doesn't nationalize the doctors. Doesn't nationalize the pharmaceutical industries. What it does is it provides a public insurance option for everyone. Hmm. Um, and so it's not like Britain's NHS. NHS is a fully socialized system, or at least it was until the Tories got a hand up, hold of it. Um, it a fully socialized system where the the doctors work for the government. The hospitals are owned by the government. Like there's, it's a fully public system right. or in, in, in theory, it's supposed to be a public system. And what the authors of health communism argue is that that's just not enough. You have to go farther because if you continually do this sort of part, quasi public, quasi private, you know, system, it will ultimately be undermined by the very capitalist forces um, who, uh, See to who um, you know who stand to benefit from its very destruction, and uh, and so when they're calling for health communism, what they're arguing for is a real a real radical reinterpretation of what healthcare would be like, and so one of the ways in which the capitalist healthcare system um, categorizes people is through what the authors call. Um, the eugenic or debt burden. So what they mean by that is an eugenic burden. I was trying to figure out like the definition of this term. um, And I was like looking online and I tried to figure it out, but long story short, basically what it means is um, that let's say you have like a disability or you're like, you're chronically ill. Um, Some people can work more than others. The system treats you differently based upon your own traits, yep. right? So, yep. so for example, like I have an autoimmune disorder, so I technically have what they call a pre-existing condition. That's a part of my eugenic debt burden ah. or my eugenic burden because, like, okay. I'm not like the ideal vision of health. You know, okay. if, like, so if like you are somebody who has disabilities, like, let's say for example, you're somebody in a wheelchair, right? Um, and Beatrice Adler Bolton, one of the authors, identifies themselves as being disabled. So, um, and so like if you, let's say you're partially blind or you're fully blind or you're deaf or you're missing a limb or you have some kind of, uh, you know, mental health issue or mental disease, mental disorder, um, those are all a part of the eugenic burden. The system treats you poorly as a result of your inability to be able to work. In, uh, in Canada, we actually have a law that lets you, uh, die with dignity if you if if the system won't let you survive well enough. Yes. So can we I want to take a quick second to talk about this cuz this is really important. Yeah. Uh, just as a quick diversion and then we'll get back to the main discussion. Um this is really sad to see the yeah. sort of death with dignity movement be co-opted for neoliberal purposes. Like yeah, it's no and shit. it's yeah. gross. Yeah. So one of the things that we as humanists have championed for a long time is death with dignity. Of course. It's something that I've thoroughly supported uh, for years. Um and and um you know and I know you know obviously probably the most historical example that people think of is Dr. Jack Vorkian, who was somebody right. who worked in the United States who helped people do this against the law. And, and and got in trouble for it. Um, but what he was doing, whether or not it was completely ethical or not, we can get into the, the weeds on that. But overall, what he was doing was a very humane thing, which was these people who had chronic illnesses. They were in a tremendous amount of pain. If they kept living longer, their health would deteriorate. It would be 
a physical burden on themselves and it might have been a financial burden on their families. Because again, this is the debt burden, right? To get, actually, so this isn't a diversion. It re, it's relevant to what we're yeah, talking about. Yeah. So the debt burden, right? A lot of times people, and so the death with dignity movement or physician assisted suicide, um, which is not a great term. I always prefer, you know, aid in dying or, um, uh, you know, death with dignity or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's a very hot topic. Um, and obviously a lot of the reasons why people are against it is religiously motivated. Yes. Um, which is and, where I, yeah. yeah. I mean, which is, I think where you and I probably would agree. That's the wrong motivation to be against. It. <laughs> absolutely. It's absolutely the wrong motivation to be against it. I can understand somebody's, uh, I can understand in specific individual cases in which it might be problematic to argue for aid in dying. But on the whole, I believe that if you have a right to live, you also have a right to die. Yeah. I don't think anybody should have to live longer than they want to. Yeah. Um, and so, and especially people who are chronically ill or terminally ill. Right. Um, who would like to, who would like to, to ha- die with some semblance of dignity where they don't have to go through the whole process. It would be, uh, <clears throat> I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're getting to this point, but it would be great if the system just lay, let them, you know, actually have a life. And maybe they wouldn't feel like the only outlet wasn't death. <laughs> exactly. So this is this is the way in which the system co-ops good ideas and then destroys them, right? So uh, you're absolutely right. So in Canada, I mean, in the United States, uh, on the federal level, on a national level, aid in dying is not legal. But in certain states, it is. Um, I think in Washington, it is. Okay. Um, that's the one I know off the top of my head. I think aid in dying is legal. So there's certain states in the U.S., where aid in dying is is legal and you can do it. Um, in Canada, obviously, it's legal all across the country. But now what they're doing is instead of having this be a humane policy, um, they're using it as a means to basically get rid of surplus populations that they don't want to deal with. And, um, and that's a key component of the book, too, that the authors talk about was the idea of surplus. Um, and so, you know, it's really sad to see something, um, like aid and dying, which is, which is an idea whose time has come. It's a good thing. It's a moral thing. It's a humanistic thing be absolutely perverted by these, these complete ghouls who have no respect for human life whatsoever. And so that's, I think that's the part that's really frustrating is how aid and dying will now be you weaponized as a means to just to to not help people yeah that's you know right. it's basically the same equivalent of like the, the those who are unhoused where instead of giving them homes which is the, the humane thing to do and mm. the cheaper thing to do um you uh you put them in prisons that you you incarcerate them yeah which often costs more money yeah um so you know which one, you know that the latter option is not only more expensive but it's deeply inhumane yeah. but they'll do it anyway because it's a way of controlling the surplus population yeah. and that's a key concept i mean they they talk about how in capitalism requires a surplus population um you can you have to have a reserve army of workers as as marx called it um and you have to have a tremendous amount of people who are unemployed because it's a means of labor discipline. Because if you had a society with full employment, um, people could just leave their jobs. There would there would feel no compulsion yeah. to stay anywhere that they didn't want to stay. Um, if they working at a job that was increasingly pro- difficult for them, they would just be like, "Well, fuck you, I'm out of here." Right? Yeah, yeah. You know. And so, if the government guaranteed you a job, or the society guaranteed you a job. Um, it, that's a huge win for workers over owners because it puts a tremendous amount of power in the hands of workers. Yeah. And that's why we don't have full employment. Yeah. That's you know, right. It's not some law of nature. It's not some unfortunate happenstance. It's for a reason it's intended. Yeah. That's right. And so we, uh, we have yeah. a couple of comments. Uh, sure. Some random geek said uh, dying on your own terms is part of bodily autonomy to me. Which 100%. Is, yep. And Kerrigan says capitalism is evil. Yes, it is. It is. Or it's almost, it, it, you could even make the other interpretation that it's not immoral, but that it's amoral. It's not even capable of making a moral judgment. Right. And that, and in some respects that you could look at it as being, that's even worse because right. then it opens up people to do evil things 
because the capitalism doesn't give a shit, you know? Yeah. So it allows people to be evil under the system. Um, but yes, no, on the, on the broad strokes of it, you're right. It's evil. But like, you could talk about it as being even the system like, itself. Even, just, just, a, it just lets people be evil and do whatever they want. <laughs> it's like the, op- it's the opposite of the Google thing that they used to say is don't be evil. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, um, it's uh, capitalism's real motto was please be evil. It's good for shareholders. Um, and so, yeah, so they, they talk a lot about how um, surplus populations, one of the ways that you control them is the way in which they get healthcare, whether they get, e- whether even they even get healthcare or not, or the varieties or types of care that they give is solely dependent upon their ability to work. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, health communism would be a society where, Everybody gets care no matter what, you know, everybody gets the care that they need regardless of cost and regardless of, 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 um, you know, and regardless of, uh, social constraints or the only social constraints that would be there would be the ones inherent in the system, whether it's like, you know, problems of supply or something like that. But again, you know, if you live in a society with a planned economy, you can do away with a lot of those problems, right? you know? Um, and that's something we'll talk a lot about when we do the People's Republic of Walmart in a few weeks. Um, nice. But but yeah, so so yeah, so they talk about the idea of surplus, and that's a, a key component, and that ties into capitalism. The second part is the idea of waste, that there's a tremendous amount of waste in the system. Um, and they say, you know, um, once certified as surplus, meaning these surplus populations, these populations are then used to stave off broad reforms that would otherwise be destabilizing to capitalism, usually through an argument that the surplus constitutes a burden to society in two ways. First is the eugenic burden, which we talked about earlier, and second is a debt burden. So we have a system that sees taking care of people who can't work as a waste. Right. So waste in this context means really two different things. One, the way in which the system views people as waste as a part of being the surplus and two, the actual like literal waste within the system itself, the way in which care is often deeply unequal and in being unequal, it's wasteful. Um, and so those who have the ability to pay, um, often get better care. And then this leaves medicines that don't get used. This leaves treatments that don't get used. This means equipment that doesn't get used. Um, you know, this is something that really happened during the pandemic that was really tr- troublesome was the fact that there were so many people not getting the vaccine Yeah, that a lot right. of those vaccines ended up going bad and then they had to throw them away. I mean, yeah. it's um, – and that's a real shame. I mean, it's a real um, – it's a real abuse that should have never happened. But again, it was about the long-term distrust of systems. Um you know, and and people were weary. Some people were weary of getting a vaccine. Well, and, and um, like, or uh, some people were just flat out anti vaxxers Like, yeah, I, like you, know. you can also like one of the things that people talk about now is like why, uh, like in in a criticism of ourselves on the, on the left is that why weren't yeah. we in the streets, uh, in the protesting about the fact that we were on our third vaccine and some nations hadn't even gotten their first. Exactly. You know, that's right. So we can get into that for a second. So um, the, the vaccine apartheid, um, t- which is how they often termed it. Yeah. Part of that was the way in which um, uh, the the intellectual property uh, related. Because here's the thing. Most of these vaccines were developed with public money in public labs with public with publicly paid for um resources. Yeah. And yet, instead of it being owned by the government and the companies make it for the government, the government distributes it directly, which is how they should have done it. Um, or the very least, they just, they end up buying facilities to make it, which is, you know, like an actual command economy could do that kind of thing. Right. Um, instead, they, you know, we, we, we socialize the development of these vaccines and then we privatize the gains. Um, and in doing so, there were a lot of intellectual property barriers. And one of the biggest champions of keeping this sort of intellectual property framework in in place was Bill Gates. Um, And Bill Gates is very clear about how he was very uncomfortable with other countries just getting the recipes to make the vaccines precisely because he said, well, their facilities aren't 
clean enough or they're not standardized enough and they couldn't make them. He essentially made the argument that the brown folks don't know how to do it, so we have to do it. It was right. extremely racist yeah. because there were plants in India that were like starting to get online. Like we can start making these if you would just yeah, let give us, us have, the yeah, give us the formula. Give us the formula. And, uh, and he said, and they said basically no, which is why you have vast swaths of the world that still don't have COVID vaccines when some people are on their third, fourth or fifth dose. And it's, I, 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 I don't know, in my head, I connect it to the same mentality that says like a doctor who moves from India, who has, is fully accredited in his country comes to Canada or the U S and then can't get a, accreditation there. Yeah. It's the same mentality, right? It's that same racism that says, well, you don't actually, you're from this country. You don't know anything about uh, uh, medicine or what have you, like the way we do it. Exactly. Um, unless you have enough money to pay. Right. Because um, there are certain people who can can sort of pay through the system. Um, because America is truly a pay to play system um, in terms of immigration. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like, and this gets into the whole thing about like, I find that the insane right, the sort of QAnon, Alex Jones crowd, have poisoned the well about criticizing Bill Gates. Right. Um, I hate that because they, I I find it. Because he sucks (laughs) and he sucks, but he doesn't suck for the reasons they think. Yeah. His main problem is that he is a shameless neoliberal who is committed to the project of intellectual property. He built his empire on creating artificial barriers to yeah. the use of software. That's how he, I mean, you know, and the last time the antitrust laws in America were really genuinely enforced was against Microsoft. And, uh, and it made him look like a dick on national television every night in his court depositions, which is why he's now been on this 20 year philanthropy kick to sort of rehabilitate his, his, yeah. um, his reputation. Most people think of Bill Gates and think, Oh, what the nice old man who wears sweaters and goes to Kenya and gives out <laughs> things. And, it's like, no, when I think of Bill Gates, I think of the dick who was on TV when I was in elementary school, like just being this arrogant, pompous He's the Monopoly prick. guy. <laughs> He's the Monopoly guy, right? And so his whole argument about the vaccines was that they can't do it. We shouldn't let them do it because um, it will undermine the production of better vaccines. Well, that's not necessarily true. Right. And But it's this whole thing. So then like Russia develops its own. And then China develops its own because they we don't we don't we don't want to co- cooperate with them. And then they'll say things like, "Well, the Russian one doesn't work, or the Chinese one isn't very good." Well, you know, if you actually cared about global public health, you would help them in build, developing a better vaccine rather than yeah. trying to put up these artificial barriers. But that's the point. The, the, you know, the, these you know these kinds of of things are a feature, not a bug of capitalism. Yeah. You know, we talked about this in in the episode on choke point capitalism. Most businesses to be really successful in the modern age, they have to sort of corner a market and then put a moat around it. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's in intellectual property law or digital rights management or some kind of barrier to entry um, to avoid any kind of real competition. Because again, and I can't stress this enough, capitalism is not about markets. Capitalism is not about competition. Right. Capitalism is about the private ownership of the means of production. That's what capitalism is. Right. You can have society – their markets have existed pretty much since humans were able to barter. Right. Um, and competition is something that, you know, I hate to naturalize it, but like competition is kind of an aspect of the human condition. Some people have it more than others. I'm not a particularly competitive person. Some people are. Right. Um, and I think competition can be done in a healthy way. Sure. Say like whether it's like the space race or like sports teams and like sports, like those are like forms of healthy competition. But, you know, but what does cap co- competition ultimately end in? It ends up in one person coming out on top over everybody else. Yeah. Right. That's right. And, and so uh, this, the sheer amount of waste that ends up happening, all of the people who don't get co- don't get COVID vaccines. And then let's say they don't get COVID vaccines and they get COVID and they die or they get COVID and they're disabled, or they know someone who gets COVID and gets disabled, or they have to become full-time caretakers for someone who's disabled. Like this is the waste that is built into the system. Um, And so, you know, and then one of the, there's a lot of like, and this is my real, like to get into sort of my broader criticisms of the book, because okay. I, I don't have many, but my bigger my bigger criticism of the book is that it uses, in some respects, heavily jargoned language. 
Okay. So it, it kind of reads like it's, it's, and so it sort of assumes that you know what they mean. And sometimes right. and it's like, like you were saying, be, uh, you had to, you were looking for the term eugenic, what, eugenic burden. Like, what yeah. does that actually mean? It basically just means that like the burden that's on someone, if they have a chronic illness or they're disabled and the way the system treats them differently than otherwise. Right. And I guess like, so, you know, it, it tends to use fairly jargoned in some respects, academic language. It, this reads like a book that may have been somebody's dissertation before, and it was sort of adapted to being a book. There are a lot, like I, as a historian, I've read books like this. There are a lot of books that um, that were somebody's PhD, dissert, they were somebody's doctoral dissertation, and then they become a book. Right. Um, so that's like my only hiccup with the book is that I find that if your goal is to try to spread ideas to get them to the biggest audience possible, Maybe using language that might alienate people is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. I just, you know, just think about that, you know, in, in developing our future world. Um, but, you know, that's why I'm here. My goal is to help, you know, try to get a sense of what this stuff means. Right. Then they talk, I mean, labor is a key component of this. So one of the things they talk about is the way in which capitalism requires us to have what they call bio certification. And what they mean by that is basically that like, that like, through the healthcare system, um, it is approving you or denying you the ability to actively participate in, in society. So whether or not you can work or not is a huge part of how somebody is certified in a society. And so um, if you if you get dis if you get injured on the job, and as a result you're permanently disabled. Mm -hmm. um, the system will no longer certify you for that form of work. And it, through having a clean bill of health, of through course. a good physical. Um, and because of that, people then often have to then go on some sort of disability or some kind of aid. But even with that, then you have to have a form of certification. So you either have to have a certification to be healthy and be able to work, or you have to have a certification that you're disabled and can't work. Right. And that process is often harder than the process of, of being able to work. Right. By design. Yeah. Um, and in the book, they talk a lot about the development of the English poor laws and the development of capitalism in early England. Okay. And how that, the way in which they sort of uh, organized how aid was given out at the time. Because the poor laws are basically like this very early form of like social welfare spending, although it's very generous to call it that. Um, and it was much harder to get. Um, and you had to sort of identify certain ways in order you, your, your, your well-being had to be a certain way in order to get some kind of aid or get, or live in some kind of you know, poor house or live in some kind of, you know, um, relief, relief home. Um and and you're also often at the mercy of charity, which is the case, which is how it is today. You know, we've seen, you know, we see countless stories about like, you know, uh, you know, young kid loses arm and this robotics firm, you know, donated the arm to the kid. You know, we, we see here these kinds of <laughs> right. Right. And they're sort of feel good stories. And in some respects, there are. I mean, it's great. You know, sure. people using science and technology to improve somebody's life. That's a beautiful thing. But what its real goal is to say, see, now he's normal. He's good right. now. He's right. The other arm, he's good now. And so you can you be certified for work. This is ultimately the broader goal. You know, it's anytime you've ever gone to a doctor's office and they ask you, is this an accident related to work? Um, and, and so it's, it's a constant bio certification process. And capitalism requires you to do that. Um, yeah. uh, a couple comments. Just uh, <clears throat> Kerrigan said uh, Robert Evans did a Behind the Bastards episode on Bill Gates. And, oh, uh, I bet that's quite good. And some random geek said, uh, uh, yeah, I have opi opinions on Bill it's Gates <laughs> and read an essay on the Gates Foundation. Okay. Yeah, there's a good there's a good book about the Gates Foundation called, I think it's called There's No Such Thing as a Free Gift. Okay. <laughs> um, that I started to read. That's kind of good. Um, I know the citations needed podcast guys have done an episode talking. They've talked about Bill Gates off and on, on a lot of their podcasts. Um, and, and I think, I think an episode of Paris Marx's podcast, Tech Won't Save Us, was devoted to Gates and Gates's philanthropy. Uh, so it's a topic that's definitely been covered and something that like, I think is, 
um, of serious concern. I mean, the whole point of being a philanthropist is to end with less money than you had when you started. Um, and he is worth <laughs> but the way they do it. <laughs> yeah. He is worth substantially more than yeah. he was when he retired from Microsoft. It yeah. is wild. Um, um, yeah, he's, he's really bad at being a philanthropist. Yeah, no kidding. Um, poor, uh, some random geek also said poor laws sounds like, sounds to me to be anti poor laws, which there are plenty of those. No, that's exactly what it is. I mean, they call them the poor laws, but they really were the anti poor laws. Yeah, it, was, that's right. it was a way of controlling surplus populations at the development of, of, or, of the early development of capitalism. Um, and then, uh, yeah. non-sequently, is giving us a wave on uh, Twitch over there. Thanks. Well, hello, hello. Thank you for joining us. And, Appreciate uh, it. And again, uh, Kerrigan says, screw Bill's, Bill really? Gates. Of yeah, course. Yeah, I mean, yes, I mean right. he, exactly. And, and, and this goes back to the question of democracy, right? Like, we as socialists, we believe in radical democracy. We don't, we don't want just democracy for going into a voting booth and picking the momentary masters of the capitalist class, right? Yeah. You know, we don't really want to do that. That's part of it, but it's not really what democracy is. Democracy is so much more. And when I talk about Bill Gates, I don't care. It doesn't matter how much good he's done. No one elected him. No one asked him. You know, there, was no, there was no discussion about whether or not he was allowed to do any of this. <laughs> right. There was no conversation. No. Nope. You know, he's unelected and, 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 and can basically do what he does. By virtue of his money. Yeah, just because he's a rich guy. Yeah. Because we live in a society where it's, where, you know, um, where to be rich is to be virtuous. Yeah. That's how it's viewed, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, and I'll, uh, you know, to, to sort of paraphrase a great pass, a great point by Gore Vidal, which is, is, I do not believe like the majority of Americans who think that to be wealthy is to be virtuous. And I don't either. I, I you know, yeah, right. I, you know, and so, you know, and he doesn't have a, he doesn't have any kind of like credentials, not, to, not, not to nope. gatekeep, but like, he doesn't have any kind of like ac any training right. in like, he's not a medical professional in any right, immunology. <laughs> like he's a medical professional. Yeah. He doesn't have a degree in any kind of sciences. He doesn't have a degree in anything. Yeah. Like that's like the thing. It's remember, he's so a, why do, he's a yeah. cop out. So why are we so giving like, him the authority to make these decisions? Why are we giving him all this outsized power? Yeah. And people can say, oh, well, you know, academics and, and the establishment can be just as much of a problem if you have degrees. And that's true. But like we have to have – like, you know, if I go on an airplane, I want to make sure that whoever's flying that plane is can do it. Yeah. That's you know? Right. Like I don't care how virtuous <laughs> I, I they are. I don't care if he's got a billion dollars. He I doesn't don't care. know how to fly a fucking plane. <laughs> I don't care if he like gave me a blanket when I came on and rubbed my feet in a first class seat and nope. gave me champagne. It doesn't matter. Can you fly the fucking plane? <laughs> and like, and that's, and that's the same thing with medicine and health is it's yeah. like, why are we leaving these major global health decisions to unelected billionaires yeah. who may or may not more likely than not, definitely not definitely have not. our interests at heart. <laughs> Yeah, you know, right. that's why that's the problem of Bill Gates in a nutshell. It's not it's not this insane bullshit that people make up. It's very clear. This yeah. is the thing that drives me crazy about the right. Sometimes it's like, dude, you are so fucking close. Like you, <laughs> you almost get it. Right. Right. And yeah. it's like it's it's the socialism of fools in the sense that they're so close to knowing what what is really going on. But they but they can't. You know, they, they then they end up shifting to. But they've got to make an anti-Semitic conspiracy. Yeah. They got to make it about <laughs> anti-Semitic or racist or yeah. anti-science. Yeah. You know, it's 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 always that kind of. It always veers towards that shit, yeah. and and that's what and that's what I mean by poisoning the well is that like it makes anybody who makes legitimate criticisms of Bill Gates to outsiders look like a crank when yeah. they're not right, and I think that's a huge problem. Uh, so. Uh, in regards to uh, the la before we got back on B Bill Gates, uh, mm -hmm. some random geek said, "Ah, yes, the medical model of disability." "Quote: You are a broken person that needs to be made whole." And yes, that, that's the robot arm. That's thing. right. Yeah, and that's then, absolutely uh, right. Nonsequently, also said uh, basically the whole problem with the nonprofit industrial complex: people given decision making power with no qualifications just because they have and can get more money. Yes, absolutely. Right. This is the problem. And, 
um, the the whole edifice is messed up. You know, my wife worked for a nonprofit for a number of years, and she has horror stories about how much she was overworked and underpaid, and um, you know, and it wasn't by any means horrible. You know, it was a largely positive experience, but but it's definitely it's an industry. It's not you know like it's it's not. Um, you know, the, you know, if the goal was to end homelessness, they would have done it by now. If the goal yeah. was to vaccinate people, they'd have been done by now. It, these aren't hard things to solve. Not really. And, no. <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's like that classic, somebody posted this on the internet, but it was like billionaire donates $40 million to university to study the causes of homelessness. And somebody <laughs> just, you know, quote tweeted it and said, motherfucker, Amir's 10 bucks, you know, like, (laughs) you know, like it's, you know, it's that it's pretty simple to figure out the causes of, of, of these inequities. You Um, personally, as a billionaire could go out and buy every fucking homeless person a house and you'd Mm -hmm. still be fucking rich. Like, well, let's think about that. You know, that absolute Montebank, uh, Elon Musk, right? Like, you know, the Walter Isaacson biography dropped of him today. Um, and, uh, you know, Elon Musk had that whole thing where he's like, well, uh, you know, if, you, if we we could end world hunger with six billion dollars. And he's like, really? So that's the case. I'll write a check. And they were like, OK, we'll put your money where your fucking mouth is and we'll show you what you need. And he didn't do it. You know, he had money to buy a website, but, you know, that, you know, that has now gone to, to hell. But but <laughs> right. he certainly but he doesn't have he doesn't have the money to end hunger which would have cost a fraction of what he spent on yeah, twitter right. or x or whatever you know you know title of ill repute he'll end up using later that's right um so it's it's yeah i mean he he is a he's a jackass but yeah i mean it's it's but again it's we 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 give these people like godlike status simply by virtue of the number of zeros yeah, in their network that's right and that's really messed up you know and 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 um and I think it impedes human flourishing and ultimately progress, you know, because I'm still one of those people on the left who still genuinely believe that progress is possible. I, yep. I you know, yep. I mean, I think that a better world is possible and that, you know, most people are basically good and we're poorly represented from time to time or most of the time. Uh, oh, uh, we, we have another uh, f- uh, person over on Twitch. Uh, okay. It, it's my buddy, David. <laughs> so he, he said, uh, I've worked for several nonprofits and it is incredibly exploitative at its core. We beg yeah. for money to pay ourselves less than we need so we can serve a bunch of people that the system forgets. That's a, yeah. absolutely right. That's exactly right. And these are institutions that should largely be either done by communities for communities or they should be done by government. It's it's yeah. you know, it's not something that you should leave to the you know, to, to the, the kind, billionaire class, the billionaire class, right? Or as, yeah. or as Tennessee Williams once said, to the kindness of strangers. You know, it's yeah. like you can't, you can't, you can't do it that way because it ultimately it ends up recreating the same kind of exploitative dynamics that a pro, for-profit capitalist firm does, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's it's disgusting. Uh, we've also um, got, uh, I guess, okay. Uh, so Kerrigan also said. They're so close, and then they go and blame it on the Jews. So that oh, was yeah. from our earlier discussion. It's, you know, they'll they'll say something about that, or they'll say something about Soros or the Rothschilds, or yep, the right. Trilateral Commission. You know, they'll 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 do the some globalist. crazy shit. The globalists, <laughs> you know, turn um, the freaking frogs gay. No, no, that's this one. Uh, mm. Nonsequently, also said, I say that as someone who works that works at a nonprofit and probably will for the rest of my life. Programs are built on what can be funded, what rich people want versus what the community wants. Yes. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Um, as, and you know, I've, I've worked in and out of government for the last 10 years, which functions very similarly to nonprofits. And there's just a lot of things that I can't do uh, as, you know, as a person who's a civil servant and that's fine. I understand that part of that's ethics. Part of that's being an ethical employee. And I get that. Sure. You know, those are actually, those are good things. Like in socialism, I still want people to be like ethical. <laughs> you know, I don't want them to be like double dealing and like, you know, and, yeah. and, and things like that or taking advantage of others. But like, you know, and so it's the same kind of thing is that, and, you know, uh, I have had friends who worked at the major historical nonprofit here in the state where there were really interesting 
unique projects that the public would have really liked, but they didn't do it because the donor, the donor base didn't want to. And the donor base was made up of people vastly well beyond retirement who are very much white. Yeah. So it was white, wealthy people. So it was, it's very difficult to, to get beyond those barriers. Um, we got, uh, I'll read this one now too, and then we can get back mm-hmm. into the book itself. Um, sure. so nonsequently also said there is this myth that wealthy people got their wealth because they have some inherent skill that makes them quote unquote better versus it's really more about privilege, power, and intergenerational wealth. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's a hundred percent true. That's straight up just a fact. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, during the days of the, the Roman Republic, you'd have the patrician class. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what they are. You know, it's, you had the patricians, you had the tribunes, and then you had the plebs, right? The tribunes were essentially like the middle class and the plebs were the working class of the poor. We still have those distinctions today. Um, we just don't call them that anymore. Right. And, uh, you know, we call them the bourgeoisie yeah. or as most uh, people in the political center often call them job creators. <laughs> um, and, uh yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, you're right. You know, it's, it's it's all of these systems that continue to perpetuate generational wealth. One of the things about America that is, I think, disastrous is that America has never truly developed a class structure. Like, we're not class conscious in the way that other countries are. Yeah. Part of that is the way in which socialism developed and ideas of socialism developed. Um, part of it is obviously the Red Scare and anti-communism. And any anything whiffs of socialism, people get freaked out about. Yeah. But another part of it is that you know Americans, a lot of Americans, buy into this sort of very comfortable myth that, um, you know, that like, well, you know, I'm just the temporarily embarrassed millionaire, right? Like, I, I will at some point be, you know, I'll be, you know, I'm, I, I'm be on that grind set, you know, I'm gonna get, you know, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna work those 18 hour days, yeah. I'm gonna hustle. And there's nothing wrong with work. I mean, if people want to work, that's cool. Like, I, you know, that's oh, fine. Yeah. I'm not, you know, what I have a huge problem with is this idea that we tell these people that if you do all of these things, that then you will then succeed. And it's like, no, that's not the case. There's a tremendous amount of luck oh, built yeah. into the system and just built in disadvantages. And so, I mean, I think like that's really the, I think the way that America has to change, like the, the United States if we can truly start developing a genuine understanding of class. And I feel like that's starting to happen, you know, and, and, and it did, it did really happen in, you know, the first half of the 20th century, you know, developing with the, the the rise of the, the labor movement and the socialist party and the communist party, there was a sense in which that was being developed. Um, but then the post-war prosperity and the growth of middle American middle class killed all of it. Cause it was like every, you know, everybody was happy. And uh, people get complacent. Um, people get complacent when they're when they're not worried about what they're eating and uh, what they're eating next. And yep. so, yeah. But anyway, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what? Else, where were we in the book? <laughs> so we're talking. We've talked about waste. We've talked about labor. There's a chapter devoted to madness, which gets into um, some random geeks. Really good point about how you know you're broken, and our goal is to fix you. Right. You know. What if these people aren't broken? What if they're just different? Right? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a, you know, that's, that's a very different way of looking at it. Um, and how they, they spend a good chunk of the time talking about like the asylum system and how that developed oh, yeah. in, the, in the Western world and how the systems of state control, because it was a way of control, right? Like the, the state hospital systems that developed in the 19th century in the United States were very brutal and awful. Yeah. Um, you know, pe- yeah. most people know them. Most people know of how bad they were through one flew over the cuckoo's nest, and, yep. and yep. you know, and 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 the there was these horrific you know photo exposés that were published, I think, in Time or Life magazine in the 1950s. And the problem is, is that in the United States, we ought, we kind of replaced the state hospital model with nothing. the The original goal was in the 1960s when Kennedy was president. One of his few achievements um, was uh, the development of what they believed would be a community healthcare, a community mental health system, mm-hmm. where instead of having these big, 
cumbersome, oppressive state hospitals, you would close them down and replace them with these community mental health systems and centers and have people live more independent lives and, 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 and treat them truly like they weren't broken. Mm. Unfortunately, that system never really developed. Um, and a lot of it had to do with by the time it was going to start developing in earnest, um, we were in neoliberalism. We were in the Reagan era and it was government cuts. And so yeah. today, um, the single largest institutions in the United States that provide mental health care services um, are prisons. It's prisons or jails. Yeah. Um, I worked um, on a project about, yeah. I was just going to say, I have a book that I've, I've started reading. Uh, it's called A Profession Without Reason about, uh, about so the psychology kind of, uh, profession and, and, and how ultimately there haven't been any, like, if you, if you do like the, I don't know how you measure happiness, but like the outcomes that they're looking for, despite 40, 50 years of development, they haven't increased the outcomes that they're looking for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and again, it, it, yeah. And it goes back to what I said earlier, which is that when you, when you constantly medicalize things yeah instead of socializing them in the sense that you start looking at problems beyond just the mere pharmacological or medicinal yeah like you're not you just get, depressed you also live in a society that constantly bombards you with shit <laughs> bingo right like you're working you know people work insane hours or they're tired or they have a chronic health issue that's not their fault yeah you know a lot of people have chronic health issues there's stuff that they're born with. They didn't have a choice. Yeah. You know, like most of my health issues are like that. They're genetic. I didn't have any choice. Yeah. You know, so it's like. You can't be, you can't be held responsible for those things because you didn't like no. pick them, right? <laughs> no. And we live in a system that held you accountable for things you had no control over. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that gets into, they talk about the pharmacology and they talk about how the sort of international trade policies, especially with the development of the, um, the international intellectual property rights oh, yeah. agreements and the World Trade Organization and the development of um, uh, these sort of global systems, um, you know, you know, it, it basically like, um, it, it took the incentives away from developing therapies and medicines that would generally benefit people to developing medicines that, that serve the bottom line. Yeah. That are that'll much pump better. you back into the system so you can pump work you back harder. into the system so you can work harder. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I think that's part of the reason if you I mean, if you think about it, right, like just on a pure, like just economics level, this is why it's very easy in the United States for men to get Viagra or, you know, people with penises, um, uh, uh, to get Viagra yeah. than it is to get the morning after pill. Yeah. Like that's a very, you know, that's a very clear, there's a reason for that. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, and it has to do with the fact that like, you know, unwanted pregnancies create unwanted people who then are either a part of the workforce or they're part of the surplus population. Right. right. That is used to discipline labor. Um, this is the real goal of the anti-abortion crowd. They'll never say it out loud, but that's really what it is. You know, they, they might, they might, you know, sort of dress it up in religious ideology, but at the end of the day, what they really want to do is make workers. They they want people to make workers yeah. because the United States' population is declining and it's plateauing. We're getting older as as a country. And of course, um, that's easier when you can control women. So, <laughs> yes. So, if you can control women, you can control the amount of of people coming in, right? Or or um, people who who uh, can get are able to get pregnant. People who people who are able to get pregnant, right? And so, those who can have children have to, um, and you just sort of have to shut up and take it. You know, um, that's why you know abortion was legalized in the United States under a Republican. And it was, and it was recriminalized under a Democrat yeah. is because none of that really fucking matters, <laughs> you know? And, uh, the, yep. the real goal is to control. Um, and then, you know, I'll end sort of talking about SPK. Um, so SPK was the socialist patients collected. It, it was developed in Germany. Um, and, uh, you know, it was founded in, in West Germany. It was, I think, and, um, and, uh, it was sort of founded by a guy named Wolfgang Huber. And the goal was to essentially, 
um, you know, changed the whole framing of everything to make, um, I think, I think it was describing something like making illness a weapon, okay. like using, using illness as a weapon. Um, and so, you know, they, they had a lot of different fights here and there. And then like, um, at one point they were labeled a terrorist group for their political activities and they were sort of giving support the uni- by the university campus on which they were on. And then, and then eventually that got removed. And then to this day, you know, for a lot of American, uh, you know, law enforcement officials, they still consider SBK a terrorist group, hmm. but their whole idea was to sort of make, you know, use illness as a weapon, basically saying that like, yes, we are people who have quote unquote illnesses, but that okay. doesn't necessarily mean that we're bad people. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't deserve equal rights in our society sure. and to move to a more radical patient centered therapeutic model, especially for those with mental, with mental Ill- illnesses. Um, so in the 1970s, there was a lot of dialogue within the medical literature about even the validity of mental illness itself. So there was, there was a book called the myth of mental illness by Thomas Zaz. Okay. Now, Zaz was a libertarian, so his politics are not great, and his conclusions generally weren't sort of of a left-wing bent. Right. Um, but there were other people on the left who sort of made very similar arguments that the things that we deem um, mental illness are actually just, um, you know, uh, strictures that are put upon us by this capitalist system. Yeah. And so, um, so – the the long and interesting history of SBK um, is something that we don't necessarily have the time within the constraints in this podcast to talk about in detail. Um, so I recommend people read the book, or at the very least, check out this part of the book about SBK, right? Because um, I think it's it's very relevant that these were patients who are learning more and more about themselves and trying to figure it out. Another group that, that the book talks about is ACT UP, which is the, the group in the 1980s and 90s fighting for um, HIV AIDS patients and, and really forcing the government to do something and, and ensure, you know, real robust public funding for the development of treatments for HIV AIDS. Okay. Um, there have always been organized groups of the left who have forced the system to really reckon with the consequences of its actions um, or inaction, right? Because like the, the AIDS crisis was largely a yeah. result of government inaction. Um, you know, the, you know, Ronald Reagan didn't publicly address AIDS until 1987. You know, he had been president six years yeah. and hundreds, you know, tens of thousands of people had died at that point. And the only reason he was pushed to do it was because of being friends with Rock Hudson. It was a very famous actor who died of AIDS um, and who um, and uh, Elizabeth Taylor, who uh, mm-hmm. the actress who, who who helped AIDS patients and and was a, you know, was a genuinely philanth- a good in a good sense, a philanthropic voice for helping HIV AIDS. So ACT UP is a really interesting story and that and it was very radical and then sort of. The, the book argues it sort of gets co-opted over time by like the system and it becomes more sort of, you know, milk toast and liberal, but it does have very radical roots. Um, SBK sort of fizzled out within a few years, but then it's, it's, um, it's sort of leaders moved on to do other kinds of projects. Okay. Um, and then they finally basically end the book with a plea to change the world, right? Because the, the, the goal is not, you know, to change the healthcare system. Yep. You kind of have to change the world. That's like right. I feel like, um, you know, healthcare is the issue that radicalized me as somebody who, starting in his late twenties, started to deal more and more with chronic illness and had to experience the healthcare system firsthand. I can tell you that it's what radicalized me. It's having to deal with health insurance companies and whether or not this thing will be covered and changing prescription costs and will my doctor's visit be covered and do I have to do my surgery at a certain time? Right. You know, when I had my sinus surgery two years ago, I tried to make sure it was scheduled before the new year so that my, because you have to hit a certain deductible and I wouldn't pay as much if I did it a certain time period mm. because I ended up paying for it, part of it, right? Um, and so we need to move to a model where we abandon these notions of scarcity and sur- and surplus labor and, you know, and, an arbitrary scarcity and move to a healthcare system for all. 
And the way you do that is through communism. I mean, that's the last step, right? <laughs> right. It's, it's, so it, it's not just a revolution in medical practice. It's also just a revolution in values yeah. and a revolution in the political will. Um, so, so yeah, so that's health communism. Nice. Um, I really, really like the book. Um, I think that besides my uh, quibbles about it being at sometimes maybe a little too heavy on jargon, um, I think it's a very good book. Um, and I think people should check it out. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, I think that to create a better world, we, we genuinely do have to change the healthcare system. And I find that's the best way to, to radicalize people because everybody hell, hates, at least in the United States, <laughs> yeah. everybody hates dealing with their insurance companies. Everybody does. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, and in Canada, we have like a lot of, uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of people who really think that the quote unquote universal healthcare that we have should be expanded to cover things like dental and mental health and, and, uh, uh, eye care. But, uh, but at present it just, it doesn't really like, I guess they, they recently expanded a little bit of, I think it's coverage for dental, but only uh-huh. if, but only if like your household makes less than a certain amount of money. Oh, okay. Again, so it's the means testing shit. Yeah. And you're going to have a ton of people who are too broke to afford it in the market. But are but are but make too much to get it. Yeah, and that that happens all yeah. the time. And again, they do that shit by design. I mean, it's it's all by design. Um, one more comment before we start heading out. Uh, okay. Consequently, on YouTube said, I think the big challenge is people understanding who is at fault for our healthcare system being so awful. Yes, I a hundred percent agree. So one of the things that I remember during the Affordable Care Act debate in two thousand nine and ten. Um, was how much bad faith was going around about the discussion of healthcare. So people, yeah. Yeah. So they also said the number of people I encounter who are, are, are like, quote unquote, it's because of immigrants. That's absurd. I mean, yeah. it's absolutely absurd. I mean, most immigrants um, who are here in the United States either don't have health insurance at all, um, or if they do, um, it's Medicare. Um, but if it is Medicare, I mean, the vast majority of people on Medicare are white. Yeah. It's very much the vast majority of people on Medicare or Medicaid are white or the vast majority of people on food stamps are white. It's not like this, this whole thing of blaming it on immigrants, you know, it, it's, or blaming it on immigrants or blaming it on the government. You know, that's the libertarian argument that we have a gen, if we had a genuine free market healthcare system. <laughs> right. Um, Cause that's, and it's like, that's never going to go wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's like. Basically, they want the system we have now, but even more shitty. I, I really don't. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, or they'll blame like, you know, they'll blame socialism or whatever. I mean, the thing about the Affordable Care Act or what they call Obamacare, which is a term I hate, um, mainly just because I hate when people do that or like Romney care or whatever. Yeah. The one I hated the most was Trump care. That one. OK, look. Just based on his track record alone, I would never want health care by Donald Trump. <laughs> no, um, that's right. Dude tried to, the dude tried to sell steaks at the Sharper Image, which for those who don't know, was like the store where you bought like the massage chairs and like the futuristic bullshit when you went to the airport. Like they like, 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 so you can, so you can get like your, your, your massaging recliner. You can get like your, your, your like steel pencil holder for your desk and yep. Trump stakes. Yeah. And Trump so like, or, or Trump university or anything he tied his name to. Right. So the thing about the affordable care act was there was a tremendous amount of stuff that was in the affordable Act that was great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, um, uh, and it was all the stuff that was universal. So it was banning lifetime caps on care. You know, there was a time in this, in the United States where the insurance company that you're under would only pay so much for money for you for your entire life. Right. And after they hit that cap, they basically Fuck stopped paying that. for anything. That was before – that was pre-ACA. That you know, The ACA got rid of that. The extending health care coverage to people until they're 26, that was the Affordable Care Act. Right, right. Um, the, ex- the Medicaid expansion, which is arguably the best part of the Affordable Care Act. Millions of people have health care today that wouldn't have it otherwise if it wasn't for the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. Um, the parts about the health, the parts about the affordable CAC that were good were the ones that were universal public regulations. Like it was like public, like government mandates and 
<laughs> expansions of government policies, right? The shitty parts of the Affordable Care Act were the the, the what they called the marketplaces. So the way that the Affordable Care Act worked was the federal government uh, provided people with subsidies to purchase health insurance on marketplaces. So you could right. get like a bronze plan or a gold plan or like a silver plan. And that, but the, the, the logic, again, this is the neoliberal logic at its par excellence was that, well, if we get people to comp- compete with the marketplace to bring costs down, costs will come down. But that never really happened because um, the, 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 um, the big issue with the Affordable Care Act and, and why it didn't ultimately work was because it was built upon the marketplace having what people called the individual mandate. The individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act said that you, by law, were required to purchase health insurance or have some form of health insurance. And if you didn't, you would get a penalty, basically a tax. Well, the government never enforced that tax, right. even though it was held constitutional by the Supreme Court. Um, it was never held constitutional. And then when Trump was president, they repealed the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. So the whole marketplace component of it, which is like you had like, the patient protections, which is one pillar of the stool. You have the Medicaid expansion, which is like the second pillar of the stool. And then you had the marketplace that was the third pillar. Well, basically, they knocked the third pillar out, so the stool doesn't work. And uh, and people said, like, oh, this is like socialism. And it's like, well, this is we're next. We're going to communism next. But what's crazy is that, like, what the Affordable Care Act was, was a huge giveaway to the insurance companies. Yeah, it was a right. huge giveaway to them. Yeah. And... Basically, it was the same policy that Mitt Romney, a Republican, had instituted in Massachusetts a few years before. And it was basically the reform that Bob Dole, conservative Bob Dole of Kansas, who ran for president in 96 against Bill Clinton, it was what he ran on in 1996. <laughs> and the idea of the healthcare marketplaces was an invention of the Heritage Foundation. It was if all that- <laughs> right wing pro market stuff. If that doesn't tell you how far the Overton window has shifted, then nothing can convince you. Absolutely. And it reinforces Nonsequently's excellent point, which is that people poison the well of the discussion by nonsense and like, you know, not really understanding the terms of the debate. Yeah. You know, yeah. like like the 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 affordable character was an extremely centrist, pro corporate, pro market, like reform. That was what it was. And all the good stuff, all the stuff that people liked was the stuff that had nothing to do with that part of it. Like the banning the lifetime caps of care, banning um, insurance companies from uh, discriminating against people with pre-existing conditions, keeping people on health insurance until they're 26, the Medicaid expansion. Yeah. Um, all of those were all the good shit of the law. The stuff that like I would, you know, like we the need other to stuff defend. Was, yeah, to placate the capitalists. Yeah, it was. It was ultimately, it was a pro-corporate reform because those were the boundaries of the imagination of the political class at the time, which, by the way, just want to remind people that before Ted Kennedy died in the Senate in, in, in the fall of 2009, um, Democrats had a fucking supermajority. Democrats had a supermajority in the Senate. They had like 60 states. They could do whatever the fuck they wanted. And, uh, and they had a huge majority in the House. And they had a Democratic president. They could have done anything, right? Yeah. And one thing that they also didn't do in the Affordable Care Act was they didn't legalize abortion. Which is what, which is Democrats have fundraised on for 50 years, which is that we're going to pass a federal protection on abortion by law. And they've not done it. They didn't do it when, you know, they didn't do it under Jimmy Carter. They didn't do it under Bill Clinton. They didn't do it under Barack Obama. And they're not going to do it under Joe Biden, which goes to show you that it's like the little stick, like the little carrot that they hold out in front of you. To get you to send your fifteen dollars, you can't scare people into voting for you or donating to the party if yeah, it's if you know it's actually like done. You know, it's it's like it's like you know you had a, you had a Democratic Congress and you had a Democratic president. You could have done this. You could have easily have done this, um, and you just and you just didn't because with Democrats, it's always what I call the rotating villain, or people have called the rotating villain. Well, we couldn't do it because of sentiment parliamentarian, or we couldn't do it because of Joe Manchin, or we couldn't do it because of Kirsten Sinema, or we couldn't do it because of the Republicans. It's like, no, you <laughs> you didn't do it because you didn't want to do it. Yeah, at some point. And let's never be honest about that. Yeah, that's right. Because at the end of the day, they they know that if they do it, then they no longer get to fundraise with it. They never get, they no longer get to run on it, which is actually kind of stupid when you think about it. Like that logic's stupid. Because like if they passed like a federal protection for abortion, that's there's right. a huge chunk of the American election that would be fucking support, thrilled. Right. 
Yeah. Like it would, it would like, like, you know, truckloads of cash would flow into the Democratic Party and like Biden would probably win re-election. Yep. Like it would it would be politically it's like a winner, but they don't want to do it. They just don't want to do it. And and I think it just goes down to the fact that in the Republican Party, there's a certain level of purity where like you have to be you have to hold certain positions. The Democratic Party doesn't have those kinds of purity tests right. to its detriment. I don't think there should be a single pro-life Democrat. The fact that there are, and the fact that the, the sitting Speaker of the House at the time, Nancy Pelosi, supported the re-election yeah. of a pro-life Democrat. It's nonsense. Bullshit. It's all bullshit. They talk out both sides of their fucking mouth. This is what I keep saying about like this idea of like, you know, the theory that we can push the Democrats to the left. We've been trying this shit. The whole Michael Harrington, like the DSA strategy of like pushing Democrats to the left. We've done this for 50 years now. Uh, it has not worked. Here's a, a a good one from some random geek. I think the Democrats just have gun laws and abortion rights as their culture wars. Yeah. Absolutely. A thousand percent. Because they know that because <laughs> – Oh. A, yeah. Um, Kerrigan asks, could you guys go in into more detail of the parts of the book you didn't cover? Sorry. Oh, that's not rude. Oh, not sure. No, uh, no. That's not rude. Um, there's one big concept that I, I realized. We did get distract, qu- distracted quite we a bit. We did. <laughs> So, um, you know, so they talk a lot in the book, they talk about like public systems that siphon money into private centralized systems of care. This happens a lot. So this is like the neoliberal model where they use tons of public money to prop up private institutions that often give really subpar care, but end up generating huge profits for the companies. Yeah. Um, the big terms that they also describe is the the big term they sort of come up with to describe something is extractive abandonment. Okay. Um, and the idea of extractive abandonment is this idea that um, by basically giving you crappier health care, by not certifying you for work or not certifying you for, for aid, um, that uh, it's going to be more expensive for you to live and by ex- and and by abandoning you basically saying you're no longer a part of like the healthy society they can then extract wealth out of you and the way they do that is through like those public systems that siphon money to private institutions through like the for profit um nursing home system or for the for profit um urgent care system or mental health care anything like that so it's a they can they can basically extract profit out of you while simultaneously telling you to go fuck yourself. It's this it's this really um, pernicious nasty system. The other thing I, I guess we didn't mention that's important too is basically that they, they um, that federal programs sort of maximize surplus value from the surplus labor population in a gamified way. So like they are constantly figuring out ways to one up themselves. And game the system so that um, so that more and more people get uh, um, less and less care, and there's more and more profit. Um, the The other thing about the SPK that I think is important is that they're sort of radical reshaping of why we deem mental illness. So a lot of these folks were people who had been deemed mentally ill, or they had like some kind of mental health issues. And the way that the group therapy model worked was that they often, in consultation with Dr. Huber or other mental health professionals who were a part of West Germany at the time, uh, they would have these sort of group sessions where they would come together and sort of share the concerns. They often helped each other with medicines and sort of making sure that they took their medicines on time. And so it was kind of like a more like positive version of the 12 step system where people held each other accountable, people helped one another and then developed systems of care that were outside of the capitalist model that were not predicated on the profit motive. Um, So those are some of the bigger things that we didn't get to discuss in full detail, but extractive abandonment, I think is a really key concept of the book that um, uh, is one of the big takeaways because I think it's true. And I think, you can take the concept of exp- extractive abandonment and broaden it out even further. Right. I think you can even say that like that pretty much is the system in and of itself, that there are ways in, in many different ways, whether it's healthcare or we were before we were talking, we were talking about like the payday loan system, right. right? Like, you know, they make it harder and harder for you to pay it back, which means that you have higher interest rates, which you have to end up paying more. Yeah. So they're sh- extracting more and more out of you while they're simultaneously abandoning you. They're simultaneously not helping you and they're yeah. asking more of you. 
Um, and so I think that's a problem of capitalism of it in and of itself. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of how do we get there, right? So it's about creating, as we always say, it's about creating those broader social movements that call for change yeah. and, yeah. and, and really call for a revolution in healthcare and a revolution in the political system um, that ultimately creates the kind of world where health communism is possible. Hopefully that kind of covers a lot of other things that we, we got to, we didn't get to. All right. So I guess, uh, what are we covering next on Thursday? We're, we're live again on Thursday. We're live again on <laughs> Thursday. So, because I, since, since I'm coming back, I'm coming back with a vengeance. I was like, we're going to do two shows this week. So on Thursday, we're going to be doing revolutionary affinities, um, by, uh, nice. Michael Lowey and Olivier Besson. Basana Court or whatever. I, I must Sano. admit, I did not finish it yet. I, I got distracted by other books that I had to deal with for other it's reasons, right. but uh, it's fine. I'm still excited it's to fine. talk about it. <laughs> but yeah, and and uh, and I won't give all the game away, so you, you have something fun I to go still, back yeah. to with the book. It's a great book. I loved it, and it'll be, it's going to be a lot of fun. It, that discussion, um, pardon the alarm here, <laughs> uh, but um. That discussion is going to be very similar to our libertarian socialism right. discussion that we had, because um, it's going to cover a lot of the same threats. Because that book, this book, is a great overview of um, uh, how Marxist theory and anarchist theory complement one another and have influenced each other, and how they can really build, um, you know, what the authors call libertarian Marxism. Very um, cool. I, so that's what we'll do next time. All right. I guess what's left. Where can people find you? You can find me at justinclark.org. That's my little website down there. Um, I, the 150th anniversary issue of The Truth Seeker is coming out this month in September. Um, the Truth Seeker, the magazine I regularly write and contribute to, um, it is one of the longest running publications in the United States. I'm very proud to be a part of the 150th issue. My article in that new uh, issue of The Truth Seeker is about Robert Ingersoll and the late 19th century order and free thinker um, who I've talked about numerous times on the show um, and his sort of memorialization of Abraham Lincoln. So it's about sort of talking about how Ingersoll viewed Lincoln. So that's in the new I issue of The Truth Seeker that will also be made available on the Indiana history blog, which ah, is I write for, cool. for the Indiana Historical Bureau. So it'll be on that blog and not my own. Um, and then, uh, you know, check out uh, all the new issue and all the new, you know, fancy edited episodes of our podcast. So a lot of you watch <laughs> yeah. it live and then Corey goes back later on and makes a really sleek, snazzy version of the launch <laughs> later on. Yeah. So there's a new one that just dropped of our episode on In Praise of Idleness by Bertrand Russell. Um, I also encourage people to read my uh, essay on Bertrand Russell sure. that complements that episode that's on my blog. Um, and as I always end this, um, please support Corey on Patreon. He does a tremendous amount of really great work. He's been killing it and being patient with his humble co-host as he gets through <laughs> some plague that I had to deal with over the last month. Yeah, well... So um, so yeah, definitely support him on Patreon and, um, just and, glad uh, you it got better. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so, so yeah, so that's where you can, that's where you can find me. And then I'm also on social media at, uh, Justin Clark PH. I'm on Instagram and threads. Uh, I'm gonna be honest with you. My threads activity has dropped off. I'm mostly active on Instagram, but I do post on threads from time to time. And I think once Twitter X or whatever, you know, nasty term he'll come up with next, for Twitter. Um, once it finally collapses, I feel like maybe threads will become the new thing, but I don't know. My, we'll my new home happens. is blue sky. So as soon as I have some, uh, invite oh, codes, I'll start sky. sending those yeah, out. Okay. That's good. That's good. Maybe I'll get on the blue. I was on the Mastodon kick there for a second, but I really couldn't figure out how to make it work. So I was, I, I felt like a real boomer trying I to I just out always Mastodon. forget about Mastodon. Like I, it's like, I did too. Last I set one up and posted to every single social media site I have. Multiple Reddit subreddits and completely forgot about Collectiva on uh, Mastodon. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I completely forgot about it too. And, um, but yeah, yeah. So I, I thank you everybody for uh, watching the stream. Uh, thank you for your comments. Really appreciate it. And Noel Kerrigan, you were not rude in any way. 
<laughs> no, 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 you're not rude. Nope. You know, if there's ever a specific thing, you know, that you want us to ask about or whatever, um, please feel free. We're here to uh, educate as best as we can. That's so right. thank you so much for everybody's comments, their questions, their suggestions. It always makes the, the show really fun, but unfortunately it does end up, me, ends up <laughs> having me go on tangents that may or may not be relevant. So I apologize <laughs> in advance, but That's I right. try. Right on. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. All right. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Christopher Taylor, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation at to me at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. Uh, or you can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for wa- listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda. 